loving the man who doesn't love back. Victim of love. I see a broken heart, you've got your story to tell. Victim of love. It's such an easy part, and you know how to play it so well, I think you know what I mean. You're walking the wire, of pain and desire, looking for love in between. Victim of love. It was Jill's first session, and she looked doubtful. Pert and petite, with blonde orphan Annie curls, she sat stiffly on the edge of the chair, facing me. Everything about her seemed round, the shape of her face, her slightly plump figure, and most particularly her blue eyes, which took in the framed degrees and certificates on my office wall. She asked a few questions about my graduate school and counseling license, and then mentioned, with obvious pride, that she was in law school. There was a brief silence. She looked down at her folded hands. I guess I'd better start talking about why I'm here. She spoke rapidly, using the momentum of her words, to gather courage. I'm doing this, seeing a therapist, I mean, because I'm really unhappy. It's men, of course. I mean, me and men. I always do something to drive them away. Everything starts out fine. They really pursue me and everything, and then after they get to know me, she tensed visibly against the coming pain, it all falls apart. She looked up at me now, her eyes shining with held back tears, and continued more slowly. I want to know what I'm doing wrong, what I have to change about me, because I'll do it. I'll do whatever it takes. I'm really a hard worker. She began to speed up again. It's not that I'm unwilling. I just don't know why this keeps happening to me. I'm afraid to get involved anymore. I mean, it's nothing but pain every time. I'm beginning to be really afraid of men. Shaking her head, the round curls bouncing, she explained with vehemence, I don't want that to happen, because I'm very lonely. In law school, I have lots of responsibility, and then I'm working to support myself too. These demands could keep me busy all the time. In fact, that's pretty much all I did for the past year, work, go to school, study, and sleep. But I missed having a man in my life. Quickly she continued. Then I met Randy, when I was visiting friends in San Diego, two months ago. He's an attorney, and we met one night when my friends took me out dancing. Well, we just hit it off right away. There was so much to talk about, except that I guess I did most of the talking. But he seemed to like that. And it was just so great to be with a man who was interested in things that were important to me too. Her brows gathered together. He seemed really attracted to me. You know, asking if I was married, I'm divorced, have been for two years, if I lived alone. That kind of stuff. I could imagine how Jill's eagerness must have shown as she chatted brightly with Randy over the blaring music that first night. And the eagerness with which she welcomed him a week later when he extended a business trip to Los Angeles an extra hundred miles to visit her. At dinner, she offered to let him sleep at her apartment so that he could postpone the long drive back until the next day. He accepted her invitation and their affair began that night. It was great. He let me cook for him and really enjoyed being looked after. I pressed his shirt for him before he dressed that morning. I love looking after a man. We got along beautifully. She smiled wistfully. But as she continued her story it became clear that Jill had almost immediately become completely obsessed with Randy. When he returned to his San Diego apartment, the phone was ringing. Jill warmly informed him that she had been worried about his long drive and was relieved to know he was safely home. When she thought he sounded a little bemused at her call, she apologized for bothering him and hung up, but a gnawing discomfort began to grow in her, fueled by the awareness that once again she cared far more than the man in her life did. Randy told me once not to pressure him or he would just disappear. I got so scared. It was all up to me. I was supposed to love him and leave him alone at the same time. I couldn't do it, 
so I just got more and more scared. The more I panicked, the more I chased him. Soon Jill was calling him almost nightly. Their arrangement was to take turns calling, but often when it was Randy's turn the hour would grow late and she would become too restless to stand it. Sleep was out of the question anyway, so she would dial him. These conversations were as vague as they were lengthy. He would say he'd forgotten, and I would say, how can you forget? After all, I never forgot. So then we'd get into talking about why, and it seemed like he was afraid to get close to me, and I wanted to help him get through that. He kept saying he didn't know what he wanted in life, and I would try to help him clarify what the issues were for him. Thus, Jill fell into the role of shrink with Randy, trying to help him be more emotionally present for her. That he did not want her was something she could not accept. She had already decided that he needed her. Twice, Jill flew to San Diego to spend the weekend with him. On the second visit, he spent their Sunday together ignoring her, watching television and drinking beer. It was one of the worst days she could remember. Was he a heavy drinker? I asked Jill. She looked startled. Well, no, not really. I don't know, actually. I never really thought about it. Of course, he was drinking the night I met him, but that's only natural. After all, we were in a bar. Sometimes when we talked on the phone I could hear ice tinkling in a glass and I'd tease him about it, you know, drinking alone and all that. Actually, I was never with him when he wasn't drinking, but I just assumed that he liked to drink. That's normal, isn't it? She paused, thinking. You know, sometimes on the phone he would talk funny, especially for an attorney. Really vague and imprecise, forgetful, not consistent. But I never thought of it as happening because he was drinking. I don't know how I explained it to myself. I guess I just didn't let myself think about it. She looked at me sadly. Maybe he did drink too much, but it must have been because I bored him. I guess I just wasn't interesting enough and he didn't really want to be with me. Anxiously, she continued. My husband never wanted to be around me, that was obvious. Her eyes brimmed over as she struggled on. Neither did my father. What is it in me? Why do they all feel that way about me? What am I doing wrong? The moment Jill became aware of a problem between her and someone important to her, she was willing not only to try and solve it but also to take responsibility for having created it. If Randy, her husband, and her father all failed to love her, she felt it must be because of something she had done or failed to do. Jill's attitudes, feelings, behavior, and life experiences were typical of a woman for whom being in love means being in pain. She exhibited many of the characteristics that women who love too much have in common. Regardless of the specific details of their stories and struggles, whether they have endured a long and difficult relationship with one man or have been involved in a series of unhappy partnerships with many men, they share a common profile. Loving too much does not mean loving too many men, or falling in love too often, or having too great a depth of genuine love for another. It means, in truth, obsessing about a man and calling that obsession love, allowing it to control your emotions and much of your behavior, realizing that it negatively influences your health and well-being, and yet finding yourself unable to let go. It means measuring the degree of your love by the depth of your torment. As you read this book, you may find yourself identifying with Jill, or with another of the women whose stories you encounter, and you may wonder if you, too, are a woman who loves too much. Perhaps, though your problems with men are similar to theirs, you will have difficulty associating yourself with the labels that apply to some of these women's backgrounds. We all have strong emotional reactions to words like alcoholism, incest, violence, and addiction, and sometimes we cannot look at our own lives realistically because we are so afraid of having these labels apply to us or to those we love. 
Sadly, our inability to use the words when they do apply often precludes our getting appropriate help. On the other hand, those dreaded labels may not apply in your life. Your childhood may have involved problems of a subtler nature. Maybe your father, while providing a financially secure home, nevertheless deeply disliked and distrusted women, and his inability to love you kept you from loving yourself. Or your mother's attitude towards you may have been jealous and competitive in private even though she showed you off and bragged about you in public, so that you ended up needing to do well to gain her approval and yet fearing the hostility your success generated in her. We cannot cover in this one book the myriad ways families can be unhealthy that would require several volumes of a rather different nature. It is important to understand, however, that what all unhealthy families have in common is their inability to discuss root problems. There may be other problems that are discussed, often ad nauseum, but these often cover up the underlying secrets that make the family dysfunctional. It is the degree of secrecy, the inability to talk about the problems, rather than their severity, that defines both how dysfunctional a family becomes and how severely its members are damaged. A dysfunctional family is one in which members play rigid roles and in which communication is severely restricted to statements that fit these roles. Members are not free to express a full range of experiences, wants, needs, and feelings, but rather must limit themselves to playing that part which accommodates those played by other family members. Roles operate in all families, but as circumstances change, the members must also change and adapt in order for the family to continue to remain healthy. Thus, the kind of mothering appropriate for a one-year-old will be highly inappropriate for a thirteen-year-old, and the mothering role must alter to accommodate reality. In dysfunctional families, major aspects of reality are denied, and roles remain rigid. When no one can discuss what affects every family member individually as well as the family as a whole, Indeed, when such discussion is forbidden implicitly, the subject is changed, or explicitly, we don't talk about those things. We learn not to believe in our own perceptions or feelings. Because our family denies our reality, we begin to deny it, too. And this severely impairs the development of our basic tools for living life and for relating to people and situations. It is this basic impairment that operates in women who love too much. We become unable to discern when someone or something is not good for us. The situations and people that others would naturally avoid as dangerous, uncomfortable, or unwholesome do not repel us, because we have no way of evaluating them realistically or self-protectively. We do not trust our feelings or use them to guide us. Instead, we are actually drawn to the very dangers, intrigues, dramas, and challenges that others with healthier and more balanced backgrounds would naturally eschew. And through this attraction we are further damaged, because much of what we are attracted to is a replication of what we lived with growing up. We get hurt all over again. No one becomes such a woman, a woman who loves too much, by accident. To grow up as a female in this society, and in such a family, can generate some predictable patterns. The following characteristics are typical of women who love too much, women like Jill and perhaps like you too. 1. Typically, you come from a dysfunctional home in which your emotional needs were not met. 2. Having received little real nurturing yourself, you try to fill this unmet need vicariously by becoming a caregiver especially to men who appear in some way needy. 3. Because you were never able to change your parents into the warm, loving caretakers you longed for, you respond deeply to the familiar type of emotionally unavailable man whom you can again try to change through your love. 4. Terrified of abandonment, you will do anything to keep a relationship from dissolving. 5. Almost nothing is too much trouble takes too much time, or is too expensive if it will help the man you are involved with. 6. Accustomed to lack of love in personal relationships, you are willing to wait, hope, and try harder to please. 7. You are willing to take far more than 50% of the responsibility, guilt, and blame in any relationship. 
8. Your self-esteem is critically low, and deep inside you do not believe you deserve to be happy. Rather, you believe you must earn the right to enjoy life. 9. You have a desperate need to control your men and your relationships, having experienced little security in childhood. You mask your efforts to control people and situations as being helpful. 10. In a relationship, you are much more in touch with your dream of how it could be than with the reality of your situation. 11. You are addicted to men and to emotional pain. 12. You may be predisposed emotionally and often biochemically to becoming addicted to drugs, alcohol, and or certain foods, particularly sugary ones. 13. By being drawn to people with problems that need fixing, or by being enmeshed in situations that are chaotic, uncertain, and emotionally painful, you avoid focusing on your responsibility to yourself. 14. You may have a tendency toward episodes of depression, which you try to forestall through the excitement provided by an unstable relationship. 15. You are not attracted to men who are kind, stable, reliable, and interested in you. You find such nice men boring. Jill displayed nearly all of these characteristics, to a greater or lesser degree. It was as much because she embodied so many of the above attributes as because of anything else she may have told me about him that I suspected Randy might have a drinking problem. Women with this type of emotional makeup are consistently drawn to men who are emotionally unavailable for one reason or another. Being addicted is a primary way of being emotionally unavailable. Right from the start, Jill was willing to take more responsibility than Randy for initiating the relationship and keeping it going. Like so many women who love too much, she was obviously a very responsible person, a high achiever who was succeeding in many areas of her life, but who nevertheless had little self-esteem. The realization of her academic and career goals could not counterbalance the personal failure she endured in her love relationships. Every phone call Randy forgot to make dealt a serious blow to her fragile self-image, which she then worked heroically to shore up by trying to extract signs of caring from him. Her willingness to take full blame for a failed relationship was typical, as was her inability to assess the situation realistically and take care of herself by pulling out when the lack of reciprocity became apparent. Women who love too much have little regard for their personal integrity in a love relationship. They pour their energies into changing the other person's behavior or feelings toward them through desperate manipulations, such as Jill's expensive long-distance phone calls and flights to San Diego. Remember, her budget was extremely limited. Her long-distance therapy sessions with him were much more an attempt to make him into the man she needed him to be than to help him discover who he was. Actually, Randy did not want to help in discovering who he was. If he had been interested in such a journey of self-discovery, he would have done most of the work himself, rather than sitting by passively while Jill tried to force him to analyze himself. She made these efforts because her only other alternative was to recognize and accept him for what he was, a man who was careless of her feelings and of the relationship. Let's return to Jill's session to better understand what brought her to my office that day. She was talking about her father now. He was such a stubborn man. I swore that someday I'd win an argument with him. She reflected for a moment. I never did, though. That's probably why I went into law. I just love the idea of arguing a case and winning. She flashed a wide smile at the thought and then sobered again. Do you know what I did once? I made him tell me that he loved me, and I made him give me a hug. Jill was trying to relate it as a light-hearted anecdote from her growing up years, but it didn't play that way. The shadow of a hurt young girl came through. It never would have happened if I hadn't forced him. But he did love me. He just couldn't show me. He never was able to say it again. So I'm really glad I made him. Otherwise, I never would have heard him say it to me. I had been waiting years and years. I was 18 when I said to him, You're going to tell me that you love me, 
and I wouldn't move until he had said it. Then I asked him for a hug and really, I had to hug him first. He just sort of squeezed back and patted my shoulder a bit, but that's okay. I really needed that from him. The tears were back now, this time, spilling over her round cheeks. Why was that so hard for him to do? It seems like such a basic thing, to be able to tell your daughter that you love her. Again, she studied her folded hands. I tried so hard. That's even why I argued and fought so hard with him. I thought if I ever won, he'd have to be proud of me. He'd have to admit I was good. I wanted his approval, which I guess means his love, more than anything in the world. It became clear in talking further with her that Jill's family blamed her father's rejection of her on the fact that he had wanted a son and had gotten a daughter instead. This facile explanation of his coldness toward his child was far easier for all of them, including Jill, to accept than was the truth about him. But after considerable time in therapy, Jill recognized that her father had had close emotional ties with no one that he had been virtually incapable of expressing warmth or love or approval to anyone in his personal sphere. There had always been reasons for his emotional withholding, such as quarrels and differences of opinion or irreversible facts such as Jill's having been a girl. Every member of the family chose to accept those reasons as legitimate rather than to examine the consistently distant quality of their relationships with him. Jill actually found it harder to accept her father's basic inability to love than to continue in her self-blame. As long as the fault was hers, there was also hope that someday she could change herself sufficiently to bring about a change in him. It is true for all of us that when an emotionally painful event occurs, and we tell ourselves it is our fault, we are actually saying that we have control of it, if we change, the pain will stop. This dynamic is behind much of the self-blame in women who love too much. By blaming ourselves, we hold on to the hope that we will be able to figure out what we are doing wrong and correct it, thereby controlling the situation and stopping the pain. This pattern in Jill became clearly illuminated during a session soon thereafter when she described her marriage. Inexorably drawn to someone with whom she could recreate the emotionally deprived climate of her growing up years with her father, her marriage was an opportunity for her to try again to win withheld love. As Jill recounted how she met her husband, I thought of a maxim I'd heard from a fellow therapist, hungry people make poor shoppers. Desperately hungry for love and approval, and familiar with rejection though never identifying it as such. Jill was destined to find Paul. She told me, we met in a bar. I had been washing my clothes in a laundromat and went next door, for a few minutes, to this sleazy little place. Paul was shooting pool and asked me if I wanted to play. I said sure, and that's how it started. He asked me out. I said no, that I didn't go out with men I met in bars. Well, he followed me back to the laundromat and just kept talking to me. I finally gave him my phone number and we went out the next night. Now, you're not going to believe this, but we ended up living together two weeks later. He had nowhere to live and I had to move out of my apartment, so we got a place together. And none of it was that great, not the sex or the companionship or anything. But after a year went by, my mother was getting nervous about what I was doing, so we got married. Jill was shaking those curls again. In spite of this casual beginning, she soon became obsessed. Because Jill had grown up trying to make whatever was wrong right, she naturally carried that pattern of thinking and behaving into her marriage. I tried so hard. I mean, I really loved him and I was determined to make him love me back. I was going to be the perfect wife. I cooked and cleaned like crazy, and I was trying to go to school, too. A lot of the time he didn't work. He would lie around or disappear for days at a time. That was hell, the waiting and wondering. But I learned not to ask where he had been because, she hesitated, shifting in the chair. It's hard for me to admit this. 
I was so sure I could make it all work if I just tried hard enough, but sometimes I'd get angry after he disappeared and then he'd hit me. I've never told anyone about this before. I've always been so ashamed. I just never saw myself that way, you know? As someone who would let herself be hit. Jill's marriage ended when her husband found another woman on one of his extended absences from home. In spite of the agony the marriage had become, Jill was devastated when Paul left. I knew that whoever the woman was, she was everything I wasn't. I could actually see why Paul left me. I felt like I had nothing to offer him or anyone. I didn't blame him for leaving me. I mean, after all, I couldn't stand me either. Much of my work with Jill was to help her understand the disease process in which she had been immersed for so long, her addiction to doomed relationships with emotionally unavailable men. The addictive aspect of Jill's behavior in her relationships parallels the addictive use of a drug. Early in each of her relationships there was an initial, hi, a feeling of euphoria and excitement while she believed that finally her deepest needs for love, attention, and emotional security might be met. Believing this, Jill became more and more dependent on the man and the relationship in order to feel good. Then, like an addict who must use a drug more as it produces less effect, she was driven to pursue the relationship harder as it gave her less satisfaction and fulfillment. Trying to sustain what had once felt so wonderful, so promising, Jill slavishly dogged her man, needing more contact, more reassurance, more love as she received less and less. The worse the situation became, the harder it was to let go, because of the depth of her need. She could not quit. Jill was 29 years old when she first came to see me. Her father had been dead seven years, but he was still the most important man in her life. In a way he was the only man in her life, because in every relationship with another male to whom she was attracted, she was really relating to her father, still trying so very hard to win love from this man who could not, because of his own problems, give it. When our childhood experiences are particularly painful, we are often unconsciously compelled to recreate similar situations throughout our lives, in a drive to gain mastery over them. For instance, if we, like Jill, loved and needed a parent who did not respond to us, we often became involved with a similar person, or a series of them, in adulthood in an attempt to win the old struggle to be loved. Jill personified this dynamic as she found herself drawn to one unsuitable man after another. There is an old joke about a nearsighted man who has lost his keys late at night and is looking for them by the light of a street lamp. Another person comes along and offers to help him look but asks him, Are you sure this is where you lost them? He answers, No, but this is where the light is. Jill, like the man in the story, was searching for what was missing in her life, not where there was some hope of finding it, but where, because she was a woman who loved too much, it was easiest for her to look. Throughout this book, we will explore what loving too much is, why we do it, where we learned it, and how to change our style of loving into a healthier way of relating. Let's look again at the characteristics of women who love too much, one by one this time.